Shalom and welcome to Jewish Jewels. I'm Neil and this is my wife Jamie. Shalom y bienvenidos a nuestro hogar. Ah, that means welcome to our home. The music you just heard comes to you from Madrid, Spain. The singers are called Atuna and they're all university students. They serenaded us in a restaurant while we were on a journey which led us to amazing discoveries about Jews in Spanish history. Jamie, I see you're wearing your shawl from Sevilla. This is my favorite souvenir. You know, today's program is about Sephardic Jews. Mm -hmm. Those are Jews whose origins are in Sefarad, the Hebrew word for Spain. Neil, my favorite combination of all time, as you know, is Spanish and Jewish. It's like Lachaim and Ole. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of passion. Many historians believe that Jewish people began to settle in the Iberian Peninsula as early as the 10th century BC, that's Solomon's era. Abundant documented evidence of a flourishing community of Jews in Spain dates from the 4th century. Ah, and that's when we have record of trouble beginning at the Council of Elvira, where marriages between Jews and Christians were forbidden. Mm -hmm. After the Visigoths conquered Spain late in the 6th century, they prohibited Jewish people from holding public office. And it was in 612 that the Visigoth king decreed that every Jew who refused to accept baptism was to be given a hundred lashes, shorn of their hair, deprived of all possessions, and then expelled from the country. The Moors then invaded Spain in 711, and things began to look up for the Jewish people. We had favor with the Muslim conquerors, and a time of unprecedented cultural flourishing occurred in South and Central Spain. Mm -hmm. It's often called the Golden Age of Jewish Culture. Cordoba became Europe's chief seat of learning. From the 9th to the 11th century, Spanish Jews led the known world in, in science, in medicine, in art, in poetry, in law, in philosophy, commerce and culture in general. As we wandered the streets of Cordoba, we saw constant reminders of this glorious Jewish past. There was the statue of Maimonides, a native of Cordoba, a brilliant Talmudic scholar and physician who wrote the Mishnah Torah, the great codification of Jewish law. Streets in the ancient Jewish section of town, which is still called the Juderia, reflect the ancient Jewishness of the city. The area where Jews lived as a community was also called an Alhama. One precious little Jewish man, Antonio Perez Perez, stands guard today at the one remaining Jewish synagogue in Cordoba, now a national monument. Hebrew inscriptions on the upper walls testify to his authenticity. The Lord gave me the privilege of sharing one-on-one -on -one with Antonio. I want you to meet him at number 20, Judío Street. Abrió esto como museo, lo puso como museo, para que, que la sinagoga se se prestigiase, vamos, mm -hmm. o sea, existiese, porque si no, pues se fuese ido abajo, se fuese derrumbado y ya, Exacto. y ya pues, pues se fuese perdido todo el rastro judío en Córdoba, porque sí. esto es lo único que se nos conserva. ¿Y su nombre otra vez? Antonio Pérez Pérez. Antonio, Antonio Pérez Pérez. Pérez Pérez. Más raro converso. Okay. <laughs> Morano converso. Mm -hmm. Term of contempt, isn't yes. it? Yeah. Morano literally means swine or pig, and, and it was a name given to Jewish people who outwardly converted to Christianity but were suspected of continuing to practice their Judaism in secret. Other names for them were conversos or new Christians or crypto Jews. At some point, Antonio's family was given a choice of converting, mm -hmm. torture, prison, or death. It's true, and today people ask, how could this possibly be? Well, the enemy of the Jewish people is still the same, Hasatan. He put it in the head of King Alfonso X, who was called El Sabio, yeah, the, wise. the wise, to decree in the 13th century that the Jews descend from those who crucified our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they said, anti-Semitic. This led to legislation that required Jews to live apart from Christians and also wear a distinctive sign on their clothing. Irrational, vicious, but that kind of animosity broke out towards the Jewish people and it was fueled by the concentration of Jewish people in professions mm -hmm. such as money lending and tax collecting. But those were the only occupations that the church state allowed the Jewish people to be in. Yeah, you know, while in Spain, we were given this piggy bank with the explanation of its origin connecting Jewish people, specifically the Marranos, who they called swine, and money you might want to get rid of your piggy banks. Yeah. Well, back to history. The situation got even worse, and on June 6, 1391, an extensive wave of killings broke out in Sevilla. The violence extended throughout the Iberian Peninsula, resulting in the destruction of entire Jewish communities, some of which disappeared forever. Yeah. Evidences of these Jewish communities can still be seen today. I bought this music box in Granada as we stroll through streets like this one that used to be the center of Jewish business. Look at this Star of David with the pomegranate, Granada, inside. Even the floors of hotels and stone pavements of patios bear the symbols of a lost heritage. Chayen, a city in southern Spain, has recently been confronted with its Jewish past, 
We learned about this on top of a castle as Jamie spoke with a Spanish tour guide. Pero ahora mismo tenemos datos que nos dicen que la judería era mucho más extensa. E incluso se nos dice que el 90% de la población de Jaén durante los siglos XIV, siglo XV, era judía. Muchos se convirtieron, presionados, se tuvieron que convertir. Cuando se cristianicen, se, va, se llaman judío converso, van a utilizar apellidos muy cristianos para, para dar a entender que ellos son cristianos viejos, no cristianos nuevos. Entonces van a tomar apellidos como de la cruz, del Jesús, apellidos muy muy cristianos, pero sin embargo es una manera de ocultar su verdadera fe, que era la judía. Spain is filled with hidden Jewish jewels. Miguel Felix's family had to contend with what was called the Inquisition. If his great-grandparents were suspected of still observing any Jewish practice, such as lighting Sabbath candles or celebrating the Passover, they would have been called before a tribunal, and the tortures invented to get them to confess their Judaizing are too horrific to mention here. Awful. You know, between 1481 and 1808, more than 300,000 people came before nice. the Spanish Inquisition. Sadly, the Inquisition was exported to Latin America. Many people don't know that, Neil, and continued until well into the 19th century. This is historical. Thousands of suspected secret Jews were flung into dungeons to await their turn to be tried and tortured. If they didn't make a full confession, Neil, even if they were innocent, yes. okay, they were condemned to death in an auto da fe. And this was a public spectacle, usually held in the center of a city such as the Plaza Mayor in Madrid. Mm -hmm. When we visited the Plaza Mayor, we found it to be a charming place, lined with outdoor tables and many restaurants. We spoke there with Gabino Fernandez, a Spanish historian who gave us a glimpse into its ugly past. Aquí, detrás de nosotros, y un lienzo del Museo del Prado lo recuerda, Carlos II, en 1780, presidió un auto de fe. Después de terminada la ceremonia, donde todos conocían sus sentencias, eran entregados al brazo secular a las autoridades civiles por parte de los inquisidores eran entregados los reos los que iban a ser quemados seguían por la calle Alcalá hasta sobrepasar lo que es la puerta de Alcalá y en un lugar que hoy está ocupado por un banco allí los quemaban el auto de fe aunque literariamente e incluso en cuadros no siempre se ha distinguido tenía dos partes bien diferenciadas. La lectura pública de las sentencias que se hacían, como aquí en Madrid, en el principal lugar, y la ejecución de las sentencias que se hacían siempre fuera de los muros de la ciudad. Gabino mentioned that if the conversos repented at the last minute, they were spared burning at the stake and were mercifully strangled to death instead. But many did choose the flames and often died reciting the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You know, Neil, this is not a pretty picture, but it's the truth, and yes. we need to know the truth. God wants us to know it so that we can learn from it. I love Spain, and I love the Spanish people. They were kind to me during the two years that I lived there as a university student, but I hate the devil, and I hate everything that he's done to God's chosen people in Spain. Torquemada, the royal confessor to Queen Isabella, led the Inquisition. He actually had a Jewish grandmother. Imagine. But Torquemada reached the conclusion that it was virtually impossible to keep the conversos from practicing Judaism in secret, so he encouraged Queen Isabella to expel them from her kingdom to maintain the purity of the faith. And on March 31st, 1492, she and her husband Ferdinand signed the Edict of Expulsion, and the Jews were given four months to leave Spain. And imagine that in this same month, Christopher Columbus met with Isabel at the Alhambra Palace in Granada in southern Spain and was given the order to make his expedition of discovery to the New World. That's why many historians believe that not only Columbus, but most of his crew were Jewish people. Luis de Torres, his linguist and interpreter, was a known marrano. He settled in Cuba and became a land baron there. Others reached Puerto Rico. Their descendants are finding their lost roots even as we speak. Jamie, my name is Amaury Antonio Arroyo Rios Torres Colon. Wow. All these names, uh, both from my father and from my mother, which we keep in Puerto Rico, we keep all of our names. They're all registered Sephardic names. You can find them in places like sephardim.com, etc. In my case, particular case, all of my ancestors are, are, came from Spain. 
the Spaniards colonized Puerto Rico. In Columbus' second trip, he discovered the island, and he left some of his people. About uh, three years ago, I visited my ancestors in a little town in the mountains of Puerto Rico called Lares. And it's well known because it's, it's nestled in the mountains. And in the early 1800s, there was an outcry to, to gain independence from Spain, religious independence, mind you. And I visited there my, one of my uncles, one of my father's brothers, the youngest of my father's brothers, uh, retired from being the principal in the school. And he took me around the city and my family, and he, he told us all about this outcry in the city and, and the things that had happened, and my father's family and my mother's family. They're both from there, by the way. And, and then he says, drops this little thing, well, did you know that this was financed by a Jewish man? that Jewish money was used to finance this. And I asked, well, how many Jews were in the city? And he said, oh, there were lots of Jews. It's just that nobody wants to talk about it. Through an accident, my sister became a buff of genealogy and then comes and, and brings me this thing that goes back to the 1700s and the 1500s. And my mother's descendants came with Columbus on the ship. And my father's descendants were from, from, from a young man that was in prison in Spain and was Jewish and was taken to, to, you know, sent to Puerto Rico to the island. And then out of all of that, uh, here I am today. Jamie, I've said this before, but it's worth repeating. Why would someone like Tony want to be connected with his Jewish past? Mm -hmm. It's still safer to be a Spanish Gentile than to be a Spanish Jew. Exactly, but it's supernatural. God is regathering his people and they are reclaiming their past, their heritage, their culture, their music, their roots. For example, Tina Reyes was brought up Catholic, but her family did things that other Spanish families didn't do, especially her grandmother, who prayed Psalm 91 over her whenever she went out. As an adult, Tina would cry whenever she heard Hebrew words. Today, as a Messianic Jew, she sings to the Lord every morning. <laughs> Incomparable is usted, maravilloso es mi Dios, quien es como mi Señor. Beautiful. I wish we had time to share Tina's entire story with you. I'm sure her grandmother made some typical Sephardic dishes. Now, Jamie was joined in our kitchen recently by Cheryl Campo, our Jewish Jewels office manager, who shared a Sephardic treat with her, albondegas, that's meatballs, but not your usual meatballs. Jamie asked Cheryl, what made the difference? It's usually the spices make the difference, mm -hmm. and in this case, there are three spices that give it that different taste, and we have allspice, mm -hmm. cinnamon, and cumin. Okay, so how do we start? Where do we well, begin? The first thing we want to do is we want to get the sauce ready because it's going to be going into a plum sauce. Oh, that's and different too. the plum sauce, we're going to be using dried plums or prunes. Uh -huh. And we have eight ounces of prunes, about 30 prunes. Okay. Uh, we have half the amount of apricots, four ounces or 15. Mm -hmm. The juice of one lemon that we squeeze. And what we'll do is the night before, we'll, we'll cut the apricots in quarters and we'll put them in a bowl with the prunes and cover it with three cups of water. So and when they're soft. Right, and in the morning, they've really softened up, and that'll make it easier to fall apart quicker when you start cooking it. Okay. So in here, I have mm. all the juice, the liquid, plus the fruit, went into a frying pan or a big saucepan, and we cooked it for 20 minutes. And this is what it looks like at about 20 minutes. The fruit is starting fall apart, to fall yeah. apart, and it's reducing and getting a little thicker. Delicious. While that's cooking, we have here a Let's pound go. and a quarter of turkey. Now, okay. you're going to do the hard part, the mixing. Okay. And this is not ordinary mixing. you got to get in and mix. So uh -huh. I want you to use your hands. Did you wash them? I washed them. I'm All ready. right, you're going like to squish. I got gotcha. you. Okay? And we're going to start with the seasoning. So we have half a teaspoon of allspice and a quarter of a teaspoon of cinnamon. 
And we're gonna go with one teaspoon of cumin. Mm. We have a half a teaspoon of salt, one half a teaspoon of pepper. Mm. We have two tablespoons of flat leaf chopped parsley from your garden. <laughs> Uh, we have two cloves of garlic that have been Absolutely. minced. Absolutely. Absolutely. have to Large garlic. cloves of garlic. Mm -hmm. We want to get that garlic flavor in there. Mm -hmm. And lastly, three tablespoons of matzo meal. And if you don't have matzo meal, you can use cracker crumbs or unflavored bread crumbs. Now here we have okay. a frying pan with four tablespoons of oil. Uh, we're olive gonna get oil, the I said, Olive oil. Spain, we're going to yeah. get that nice and hot. And we're going to just start making meatballs. And we're going to fry it golden brown. And you know, Jamie, earlier this morning, I did get some already ready. We're gonna put them into the pan. You just mm. stir that. I'm gonna cook that about another 25 minutes mm -hmm. so all the flavors blend and the sauce thickens. And I have some finished ones oh. right here. Oh, well, we must. Okay, we serve them with some Valencia oh, rice. Oh, yes, we must sample them. Okay, let's check out these albondigas. Mmm, with the salsa. Mmm, mmm. Deliciosa. Riquisimas. Right for the free recipe. Receta. You know, Neil, that plum sauce is authentically Spanish from a 15th century recipe. It shows the Moorish influence on the Jews in southern Spain. At one time, Jews flourished in northern Spain. Although we didn't get to that part of the country, our friend Doris Alarcón Friedman did. It was there that she discovered her Sephardic Jewish heritage. Well, I went to Spain as a tourist. And I was going to, on my way to Barcelona, when I see this sign, and it says Alarcón, and that is my name. So I say, oh, I just got to see what is in there. Mm -hmm. So we go there, and, and it was beautiful. It was a middle-aged town, exactly as in the middle age, with a beautiful castle, with the moat and the bridge. But the, I never related it to being Jewish or anything until I became a believer. Now it is my 18th year as a believer. Yes. And, um, and then I went to Israel, and I started to do the Israeli dancing. And there was such a calling. It was so overpowering, the calling for Israel. What I started to feel in my, in my soul, in my heart, that I, I just started to ask the Lord, could it be that I have Jewish roots? This, this is too, too strong. I cannot handle this. You just have to show me whether I have Jewish roots or not. If I don't have them, it doesn't matter, but I just want to know. Yes. And then I started to find out my genealogy. I found my name and I found the history of the Alarcón family. It happens that this gentleman, Martinez Ceballos from Asturias, he recovered the locality of Alarcón from the Moors that were holding that locality. So as a prize for his courage, the king, Fernando, allowed him, gave him the locality of Alarcón and allowed him to use the name Alarcón as a surname. What an interesting way to get your last name. It really is, Jamie. But now let's go to the city of Toledo in central Spain to hear Maria Teresa's story. But before you meet her, we want to share just a little bit about Toledo because of its rich Jewish past. It's located 30 miles south of Madrid. Toledo is situated on a small hill. The Tajo River flows through the city. Jewish culture began to flourish in Toledo in the year 712 when the Moors conquered the city. As we strolled through the old Jewish quarter of Toledo, we felt as if we had stepped back in time. So many Jewish names and streets and synagogues, now museums or tourist shops, were taken back by the sight of these chains hanging from the sides of this church. And right next to the church is a cliff where Jewish people were thrown over to their death. So much sadness, but you know, juxtaposed with the sadness, there was great beauty, like this amazing plate, damascenado, damascene, made by artisans who learned the trade from their ancestors. I also have a pin in the same kind of yes, pin that your mom mother, brought me right. back from Spain, and we have this bracelet. Gold and silver are threads which are hammered by hand onto a black enamel steel plate mounted on a silver base. Jewish symbols abound, of course, a reminder of what once was. Mm. And now to Maria Teresa who along with her beautiful family operated Judaica shop in the old Jewish quarter of Toledo. 
These Messianic Jews have reclaimed their heritage and are making the astounding statement within Spain that you can be Jewish and believe in Yeshua, Yeshua the, Messiah. the Messiah. It's been now about eight or ten years that uh, I realized that uh, I had Jewish blood mm -hmm. and it was because I had uh, an inward emotion, like a feeling inside that uh, I felt my Jewishness. Then I felt that maybe I was crazy because I, I wasn't brought up as a Jewish girl. And then I asked uh, Hashem to give me a dabar from Tanakh. And then uh, mm, he gave me a word saying that, uh, saying the Jews that they are in the Galut, in the diaspora. No? Then I began to, to study the genealogical, uh, gen genealogical tree of my family. Mm -hmm. And then, to my surprise, I found that the village of my parents was, uh, was a town that uh, had uh, 40 Jewish families before the expulsion. Today is a very small town in the province of Lerida, Catalonia, mm -hmm. and maybe today has uh, 5,000 inhabitants and no trace of Jewish past. And then I found that uh, there was a Jewish cemetery, uh, the place of the synagogue, and then I began to study, and then I saw that many names, many Catalan names of my neighborhood, they were Jewish, oh. like Porta, like uh, Riera, and fin. Mm -hmm. And then my eyes opened to a, a new reality of that village. Even this village, the name is Agramun, is in, in the, is, uh, you can look it up in the Encyclopedia Judaica, in the Jewish Encyclopedia, is Agramun. And then uh, the, my ancestors, some of my ancestors, the family Vicente, used to live there for many centuries. And I found in a book that they were conversos. And then when we were living in Israel, our Jewishness, was rising up. And once we had to come back to Spain, we began to study our roots, everything. And we began, we felt that our call from Hashem was to restore our Jewish roots, that once were lost or forced or stolen. Mm -hmm. no? And then to me, this is that really Hashem is reconciliating the history, because here the Marranos, even if they were, if they were sincere in their faith, they had to cease to be Jews. And that was never the will of God. God wants Jews to remain Jews. Before we leave you today, we want you to be blessed by a song in Spanish about Jerusalem, sung by Jonathan Sattel. It is a song of hope, the hope of the ages for Jews, next year in Jerusalem. El año que viene en Jerusalén must have had such deep meaning in Spain as longing souls reached to connect with their roots. Jerusalén Tierra sagrada, la prometida, viejo refugio del sol, Jerusalén, clara y dorada, muda resistes, siglos de guerra y dolor, subiendo voy, por el camino, pues el destino, y tierra santa, no oiga el pesar de tus lamentos, mi tierra santa, Jerusalén. Jerusalén, antigua y joven, muda resistes, siglos de guerra y dolor. Jerusalén, con esperanza, desde tus muros canta un mensaje de amor. Trae la paz a los hermanos, sin diferencias de origen ni religión. Universal, madre de todos, con fe te canto Jerusalén. Jerusalén, sé que me escuchas, tus rocas vibran, lates con un corazón. Jerusalén, rompe barreras, une a los pueblos, enseña un mundo mejor. Alta, inmortal, novia del cielo, hermosa brillas, con esa gracia especial. Recíbeme, soy peregrino. Bíblica Reina Jerusalén 
Gracias, Jonathan. In 1992, on the 500th year anniversary of the expulsion of the Jewish people, a delegation of Christians went to Spain to repent. And our prayer today is that that repentance may be real and widespread. May Spain be blessed once more. May all the descendants of the Jews of Spain find not only their roots, but their God. And may they reclaim their God-given right and destiny to be Jews who have found their Jewish Messiah, Yeshua, and live as completed Jews, judios completos, through the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit of God. Que el Dios de Abraham, Isaac y Jacob les bendiga a ustedes con su paz, su amor, su gozo y su salvación con su Yeshua, el Mesías de Israel. Les regalo esta rosa de parte de su Padre, de Dios de Abraham, Isaac y Jacob, que les ama con un amor profundo, divino, eterno. No hay medida del amor que Dios les tiene. Bendiciones en el nombre de Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. You are my shepherd, my loving guide. You are the rock in which I hide. You are my song in the daytime and my peaceful rest at night. Are my portion and my delight. In Yeshua, Jesus, the middle wall of partition is broken down. Male, female, Jew, Gentile, all one in the Messiah. If you were blessed by this program, please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon to get notified when new programs become available. Whether you're reconnecting with your Jewish roots, or searching for the Messiah for the first time, Jewish Jewels is here for you. Leave a comment or prayer request, we'll be sure to respond. And for additional resources like books and gifts and articles of Judaica, visit our website at jewishjewels.org. We want you to become part of our Mishpacha family and grow with us in spirit and in truth.